The Kakadu National Park is a jewel in the Australian crown. It's World Heritage listed for natural and for cultural values. But uranium is mined here, and the government has given the go-ahead for energy resources of Australia to open another mine, Jabuluka. There's been unanimous protest from the traditional landowners who fear economic, social and environmental destruction. Police in the Northern Territory have arrested 112 protesters at the Jabaluka uranium mine site within Kakadu National Park. Superintendent Warren O'Meara from Jabaru Police says the protest action turned significantly more aggressive this morning. He says protesters have cut the water supply to the mine site. The protesters uh, have locked themselves with various locking devices. They've also, uh, on the outlying areas on the southern side, they've, uh, they've cut the six-inch water mains that provide water onto the mine lease. Kakadu National Park is home to the Mirar people and the world's longest living culture. But after 40,000 years, these people are fighting for their very survival. Yvonne Margarula is the most senior traditional owner of the Mirar clan. This one good taka. When her father, Toby Gangali, died in 1988, responsibility for looking after the country fell squarely on Yvonne's shoulders as the eldest child in the family. I'm born in the bush. When I was baby, I didn't sleep with a caught baby, what they call that little thing, eh? I'm born, I born and then I was sleeping with the ground, with a fire. Because we know the own the country. We know we born the country. This is our country. Black country, not white country. The Aboriginals live Binning Way, Blackfellas Way, very different to Balanda Way, Whitefellas Way. But Balanda, the white man, has long understood the value of uranium in an energy-hungry world. In 1979, the Ranger Inquiry gave the green light for mining to start at the vast Ranger uranium mine in this park. The inquiry specifically rejected the wishes of Toby Gangali and the other traditional owners opposed to mining Kakadu. That's why I already ruined all the culture, everything. The ranger mine. And he's gonna go ahead, what, Jabaluka? More problem coming up. This is where the mine will go. There are sacred sites of significance throughout this valley. So significant that Yvonne cannot even talk about them to people outside her own clan. To explain that they're there and endangered by the proposed mine. If it goes ahead, Jabaluka will be underground, below the floodplain in an area infamous for its big wet season. The mine site is right near Kakadu's famous wetlands, which attract 300,000 tourists each year. The mining company, Energy Resources of Australia, ERA, plans to bulldoze a road through this valley, 22 kilometres long from the Jabaluka mine to its current ranger mine. Here the ore will be processed into yellow cake and exported. Here outside ERA's HQ, protesters decry mining of uranium 
the world's most dangerous mineral. The heritage of the Mirar people clashes head-on with the government's willingness to cash in on uranium sales overseas. The whole Australian nation will be embroiled in this issue. Jabaluka is the first of 26 possible uranium mines in Australia, which the Howard government will be asked to approve. The Jabaluka Mining Company claims it wants to negotiate with the Aborigines and give them a fair deal. That's what we're proposing to do, to meet all the concerns they have uh, and to move ahead together so that the economic benefits which come uh, from development, including the mine, can be used in a constructive way to benefit Aboriginal lifestyles. Money is not going to fix anything. It's going to kill us. When we see that money, oh, people are happy to see that money. But not for me. They can take him back to white men money, not black fella money. In their struggle to stop Jabaluka, Ivana and her clan have enlisted the help of their relative, Jackie Kotona, as the executive officer of the Gunjemi Aboriginal Corporation. There are people, traditional owners, they're saying no. We don't want mining in this country. We want to keep culture strong. We want to have a future for our community. We want a future for our children. And people are here today because they want a better future for Australia. Uh... What you've got to realise is that uh, the Aboriginal community in the Northern Territory has been um, uh, severely disturbed over the last hundred years or so, ever since white people came into the, the region, uh, starting with uh, missionaries and buffalo hunters and so on. Uh, many of them left the land and then came back when uh, uh, land rights were introduced. In fact, the people out there really are a lot better off than, in one sense than uh, than people, uh, Aboriginal people in other parts of Australia, in that they have their land, they've won their land. The Land Rights Act was passed by the Federal Parliament in 1976. At last, Aboriginal people would be given legal guarantees to ownership of their land. But for the Mirar people, legal title to their land bought with it a mining company and tourism. All the intentions of the Australian public to ensure that justice was served for Aboriginal people failed. And often we look at it as land rights being born here and land rights dying here. Welcome aboard Ranger Mine Tour. My name's Robert. And um, for the next hour and a half, I'll take you through uh, just the processing mill. 79 was a very important year. There was, the Northern Land Council was formed, Kakadu was declared a national park, and the mining was given to go ahead. So in 79, there's three very important factors there. The Northern Land Council was formed, mainly just to help with Aboriginals uh, cope with what was going on, on in their land. When the Ranger Mine got the go-ahead in 1979, the traditional owners dared to say no to the combined forces of the government, the mining company and the Northern Land Council. The Land Council was an organisation created by the government to represent Aboriginal interests. But if the Mirar people thought it would support their opposition to mining, they were in for a big shock. Toby Gangali was the traditional owner of the land affected by the Ranger and Jabaluka mining leases. Well, I took over when my, my father died. And, uh, that's where I mean, my country. I didn't like it to mine, you see. The danger mine. You know, very dangerous. 
we like to lend this table. Huh? For we register our lives, see? Yeah? Well, that's what we like. That's why we try to get the land back, and you know? I just say we we go meeting, you know, for like, land cancel and that, and they land cancel, you know, help us, you know, keep the back us, you know. <laughs> we try to get the land back. That's all we. That's what we offered. But in 1978, they were abandoned by fellow Aborigines on the Northern Land Council. The community which will be affected by the mining at Ranger have had a fair chance to say what they want to say. This does not mean that the members of the Northern Land Council have to do what the community say. Toby smelt a rat. I can tell you, it jumped, you know, you know, in the finger. Or you, you, you push from somewhere, somewhere, some, whether it's gunmen or, you know, every unit there, Mr. Biner or something, or, uh, uh, Prime Minister, what you call him. When you make the decision, having in mind that we are entitled to be pushed around by any government that will have a power. We are being pushed around today, and we will be pushed around tomorrow. And we will be pushed around forever. And that is the fact of life. So they asked me, what do you want to do? I said, well, Tob, you had a Toby Gangele. He was speaking this morning clear and well. He said, now Ranger Mine is closed. We don't want Ranger. We don't want Grimmin signed. The Yarn Telly meeting does not accept the proposed Ranger agreement at this time. The mining companies left empty handed and the government was out of patience. This has been going on for a long time. Six years it's been going on. So the question now isn't whether or not there is going to be mining, but how it's going to be carried out. We think it is a fair agreement, and we think it's a proper agreement for the Aboriginal people and for the whole of Australia. And we have now reached the time when we need to make a decision. I'm Toby. That's my country up there. I reckon uh, here by time, we can be busy walking on. We don't know, we don't have the time to grieve now. We're not going to mine now. In your heart, you would prefer that mining didn't come about. It, it didn't take place. We know that. But as I said to you earlier, the government have had to listen not only to the voice of the Aboriginal people, but to the voice of all Australians. We can take the, the worry, the heartache away from us. We can use this range of uranium agreement as a foundation for you people to look to the future for yourself and your children. And so Toby signed, under duress and in confusion. It's too soon for the people. They haven't decided, they haven't decided yet. They were just pushing people, pushing the people to sign the agreement. And Toby? Thank you very much for yesterday and today. You are my work. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll be around in the park so that you can you can show me around <laughs> when you're doing this and um, all the range. Yeah. No, it's going to be a great thing for the future. Look forward to seeing you there. Toby might have signed for the Ranger Mine and got a silver pen for his trouble. What he really wanted was the title to his land. No sooner was the ink dry on the paper than the pressure on Toby to agree to another uranium mine started all over again. This time, the mining company was pan-continental. They wanted a lease for Jabaluka. And they was keep humbucking for meeting. All the time? Yeah. When he used to sick, sleep inside, and then they used to come and knock, knock door and wake him up. You want to go meeting tomorrow? Or you want to go meeting now? Or you, you know? Sometimes my dad used to say, "No, I don't want to go meeting tomorrow." 
but I'm sick. He was so worn down that he couldn't sit at that meeting. He spent most of the meeting laying down. And finally, at the end of that meeting, when the question of consent was put, he got up and he addressed the legal advisors and the people attending that meeting. And he said, I'm tired now, I can't fight anymore. That was consent. That was officially and legally all that was required to embody legal consent for a project to go ahead. For the next six years, Toby watched as the ranger mine carved up his country. His health declined as his drinking increased, and he ended up in hospital. One day later, I think, we went and then finished him. The ad was finished, passed away. OK, we're going over to the Jabaluka lease to have a look at a site where we're preparing to drop a banner on World Environment Day. So where are we going to hang this? That's nice and easy, that face there. Today, Toby's relatives and other Aborigines are still protesting the mine. They have to find a way to counteract the mining company's huge publicity machine. Energy Resources of Australia only acquired the Jabaluka lease from the original mining company, Pan Continental, in 1991. The RA pays an annual royalty payment of $400 to the Aboriginal people for the use of their land. This area over here, uh, it's a retention pond one they call that, it's man-made and that's just to, it acts as a filter uh, from water, runoff, runoff water in the, in the wet season off the mining area, Health, very healthy body of water, there's plenty of uh, bird life here, there's, there's fish, there's plants, there's frogs, uh, so there's, that's just a, a very clean drinking water. Which way now JJ, this way? The Mirror are considering whether to hand the royalty money back to ERA. They discover that the Jabaluka lease was only signed because they were sold out by those who were supposed to protect their interests, the Northern Land Council again. Today's meeting is very important for the Mirar people and for the people who are supporting them opposing Jabaluka going ahead. Today people will talk about handing back an amount of money which has been paid in royalty for the lease for the Jabaluka mine. Mira are saying they don't want that money because it comes from the Jabaluka lease. They don't want the Jabaluka mine to go ahead. They don't want the money that comes from the company because it's keeping that old agreement alive. They don't want to keep that old agreement alive. That mining company is uh, saying that they've got um got an agreement for that Jabaluka mine from 1982. An agreement with uh, the Land Council that means that they don't have to ask permission from traditional owners today. A big meeting was held at uh, Jar Jar in 1981 where the Land Council talked to a lot of people. There will be no decision made by the NLC about that mine Going ahead, not going ahead, until the traditional owners were ready for that to happen. This is Jacob Nayingul. 
He was the translator for the Northern Land Council in the negotiations with traditional owners for Jabaluka in 1981. He confirms that the owners thought they were negotiating for a land claim, not another uranium mine. No one understood, even, even I tried to uh, interpret what the uh, land council lawyer told me. But um, I think it w didn't come out straight to, to main tradition on. But as far as I know, he kept on saying no. So as far as you know, the traditional owners were not agreeing to mine it? No. And I think what happened was that you got put into a process that people didn't want. You, no one wanted to negotiate a mining agreement. So when it came to the finish, right at the end, it was all over. That mine was going to go ahead. It's just lucky that mine hasn't gone ahead. In an historic move, the Mirror decided to hand back the royalty payments for Jabaluka to the mining company, ERA. 17 years after the lease was signed, Galarui Yunipingu is still chairman of the controversial Northern Land Council. He believes the Land Council must honour the original Jabaluka mining lease it signed on behalf of the Aboriginal owners in 1982. Yvonne and her clan supporters are going to give Galarui a letter which states their decision to hand back the lease money for Jabaluka to the mining company. The Land Council are beneficiaries of agreements which are reached on Aboriginal land and they potentially are beneficiaries of the Jabaluka agreement as well. And some people would say that the Northern Land Council isn't interested in fulfilling traditional owners' instructions because they would then sacrifice a monetary benefit which would uh, keep the organisation going. People form the conclusion that the Land Council really belonged to the government and that's been a critical social impact out here. That people have no infrastructure with which to articulate their views. So the sense of powerlessness became entrenched. The sense of powerlessness pervaded all parts of everybody's life. Mr Yunipingu declines to comment. That pervasive sense of powerlessness has meant that many Aborigines are unable to lift themselves out of crippling poverty and hopelessness. It's led to a terrible rate of alcoholism and infant mortality, three times that of other Australians. There's an impossible wave here that people have to push against to be able to overturn the lifestyle which has come about as a direct result of the history in this area. You can't expect individuals to be able to overcome those barriers. There has to be an ability given to the community. There has to be resources provided. There has to be infrastructure which reflects indigenous values and beliefs to be able to turn this around. So far to date, um the Ranger Mine gives the Aboriginal people 4.25% gross sales. To date, that's $125 million. So, as you can see, it is quite an amount, amount of money. That now gets divided up into, into three different categories, the Northern Land Council, Aboriginal Trust Fund, and the Gagaju people. Very little of the Ranger royalty money actually reaches Aboriginal people in Kakadu. Most of it is swallowed up by bureaucracy and infrastructure. The Northern and other land councils take 40%. Another 30% stays with the Aboriginal Benefit Trust account and never reaches Kakadu. The remaining 30% goes to the Gaguju Association for basic services which the government should provide. Much of Gaguju's royalty money is now being used to pay back substantial bank loans from Gaguju's business ventures. Ranger 
has meant little real gain for Aborigines. The Gagadu enterprises have been able to generate a profit or a reasonable profit. There's been no money to be able to put back into providing social services for Aboriginal people out here. Gagudju Enterprises has invested in tourism at Kekudu, but again, it's white Australians who seem to be reaping the rewards. If you walk inside that hotel, you're certainly not going to see any Aboriginal people working in it. If you go to the laundry, you might find one or two Aboriginal people working there. In fact, you, you, you will probably find Yvonne working in there. I think if you look at the, uh, the social and economic indicators of um, Aboriginal people here in Kakadu, there's been no real progression, even with uranium mining here. Yvonne and Jackie are off to a rally organised by the Northern Territory Environment Centre. Last week, we had Philip Shervington dismissing environmental concerns as merely philosophical. We sent a pretty clear message this week saying 65 million tonnes of nuclear waste, which is what will be produced and buried and left there forever in Kakadu, is not philosophical, Mr Shervington. It's very, very real. And I, I guess the clear message is if it was going to be buried in his backyard, he wouldn't be saying it was merely philosophical. The mine hasn't provided anything for our community that has raised the standard of living or improved those health statistics which are so shocking in Australia. Mining doesn't solve anything and there's no evidence that a new mine in that area is going to improve the standard of living for Aboriginal people. If you can't stop a uranium mine in a World Heritage listed area where traditional owners are opposed and we believe the majority of Australians are, what's going to stop them? As you can see, this is a tailing stamp, it's not exactly what they call a pretty sight, but that's just the waste from what's left. A lot of the colour you can see in that is mainly just due from uh, the lime that's used to neutralise the, the tailings, and it has a very high uh, salt content, like an Epsom salt, so that's what that, that what a lot of that white colour is from there. It's a very uh, thick, heavy mud consistency like. As you can see, this is... Uh, there's not a lot of plant life or bird life in this area, mainly due to the high salt content. The government also plays down the environmental impact of the Ranger mine. The impact of uh, the present mine has been absolutely negligible and it's been measured constantly by the Office of the Supervising Scientist. In fact, it's the, the most heavily uh, uh, monitored mine in the world today. And, uh, uh, they have uh, consistently reported uh, with independent reports that there's absolutely no impact, no impact that can be measured outside the boundary of the mine. The Office of the Supervising Scientist was set up by the government as the expert body to monitor the environmental impact of the mine. To save costs, much of its data is now provided by the mining company itself. Of all the authorities that should be willing to speak on the public record, this is surely it but the minister has instructed his office not to comment. The miners see the management of the mine as a simple matter, a job they do well. We don't add any radioactivity to what's already there naturally. Uh, we extract the uranium out uh, and then we put the ore as tailings uh, back in the pits, in the open pits, and uh, when mining is finished, that will be dried out, covered with rock and topsoil and revegetated. So it will be basically as it was before mining began. It will be back uh, in that nest in the ground, a geological uh, cocoon, if you like, uh, where it's been for hundreds of thousands and millions of years. But environmentalists dispute that radioactivity can be so neatly put back into the ground after it's been disturbed. They say radioactivity from the tailings or fine particles left after mining can drift in wind or rain. Uh, the open pit mine uh, is a greater hazard for the people in the vicinity because the gas can move off of site 
and you breathe in the gas, then the uh, solid particles, the lead, bismuth, and polonium, are deposited in the lungs and go through to the bloodstream and cause internal problems in the body and can cause uh, birth defects and teratogenic dam damage to a child in utero. The tourists in the Kakadu National Park would no doubt be disturbed to learn of the invisible, odorless radioactivity which environmentalists claim is released by uranium mining. They say it decays into solids which are deposited on the ground or water and it can travel very far. It's a very heavy gas. It's about seven times heavier than air, so it, it stays near the earth. And if your uh, wind, say, is 10 kilometers an hour, uh, then in, in uh, 24 hours it can go 240 kilometers. But the mining company insists that radioactivity is naturally present and not dangerous. The, the, the radon gas is given off naturally there. I think one of the but that anyone that's actually dug, it's sort of, it's more exposed and it's sort well, of... Well, it's, it's given off as part of the, uh, yeah, but I mean, that's, it is a gas and uh, it, uh, it certainly will, uh, will go the way of all gases, but I think that... Uh, Won't that mean it gets into the water table well, and it uh, filters through? No, it doesn't. And I think any suggestion by anyone that the mining is going to poison the water table, again, is absolutely frivolous. Students converge from all over Australia to lend their support to the growing opposition to Jabuluka, which is still going ahead. Why are you doing this? Because we're going to stop the mine. We're here in support of the Mirar people and we're going to stop this mine. It's not right. We're here today as students um, and as part of the community, the wider community, opposing the mine. We're standing outside the Ranger Mine, giving our voice here, and there are people all over Australia doing the same thing today. It's also really important to the Mirar people who live here. It's their traditional land. They've got a spiritual link to it. You can't just come and carve it up. You know, you can't just put a scar in the earth and then cover it up and say everything's all right. It's not on. And it's really important that Australians listen, that people stand up and say, we're not going to stand for it. It's unwanted. It can't go on. But Belanda, the white man, still won't listen. The Minister for the Environment, Senator Robert Hill, has decided to reject the opposition of the Mirar people. Much of the Australian public and even a World Heritage Commission request to stop the mine. He says there'll be no impact on Kakadu from Jabuluka. Yet his own department advises that the mining company's environmental impact study was deficient in key areas. So Yvonne Magarula must look further she has taken the matter to the courts in an endeavour to strike down the mining lease, appealing her case to the full bench of the Federal Court of Australia. She convinced UNESCO to investigate whether the world heritage values of Kekadu are threatened. In December 1998, UNESCO gave ERA six months to respond to the dangers it identified before it would put Kekadu on the endangered list. The international jury is still out. Uh, it's 
big. It's just so big. We underestimated the bigness. Um, getting up there, now we're finding that the paint is sticking. The paint is stuck to the banner. We're having problems unfurling. It's not going to unfurl very gracefully. Italian from Italy. Uh, I, uh, uh, greetings for you. Uh, very, very, very good that uh, you make you uh, do sign your life, your uh, culture, your singing, fight for your country. my own culture. Black fall away. Yeah, right way, proper way, guinea way. Balanda should listen. And believe. How many times we're gonna tell him? <laughs> <laughs> 